This is Magdalena here, Hormones Balance. I'm here today with Dr. Ellen Hopkins. Um, super excited to be able to bring to you a way to order labs, urine as well as blood, um, you know, on your own without having to negotiate, argue and beg a doctor for ordering these labs, which so many of you are asking us every day, what should I order? How should I order? And so, you know, this took me a while to figure this part out because I couldn't do it on my own. But then there are obviously uh, people in the, you know, that, that, are, that are creating these opportunities for us. And so today, what we're going to be discussing with Dr. Allen is um, how do you, what are the markers that are really important in hormonal balance? I think that's the first thing we're going to be looking at. How do they, because it's not just hormones, what you're going to discover today is not just hormones that we want to measure. We also want to measure a lot of other imbalances that are happening in the body that actually cause hormonal imbalances. Many of you have asked us about Dutch. That's one of my favorite urine testing uh, panel. And so that we're going to be talking about that as well because we've, we found a way to actually order the labs from them uh, directly through Dr. Allen and his company. So hi there. Are you on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Hey, super excited and really excited to be here to talk to your community about direct access lab testing and in uh, this particular resource. Um, and I, I, I think it's awesome and I'm super excited to get started. I did prepare a PowerPoint for you guys that, uh, that I'll be happy to share as well. Awesome. So before we um, transition over to the slides showing you what to order, what does the, the different markers mean, which I think is a wonderful also educational piece. Um, towards the end, we're going to be talking about what the, the different panels that we created for the Hormones Balance community. So there's going to be three options, and um, two, um, what, two of them include Dutch as well. And, um, you know, the, also the good news is that if you are a health coach and you work with um, clients, and you've, you might find this presentation incredibly uh, powerful as well and super helpful. In fact, uh, Dr. Allen, I think a lot of your clients right now are health coaches, right? Because it really empowers them on how do you work with patients or with clients and how do you help them through their nutritional deficiencies and imbalances. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we've made a business decision to work closely with health coaches to try to provide them value in their own practice. And, uh, you know, health coaches are typically those people who have had some issues in their life or they're just optimizers where they just want to be as healthy as possible and they're yearning for education. So it's not only direct access lab testing, it's, you know, what do these tests mean? What are, are, what are considered normal values? And then what are the optimal values? It may be functional medicine doctors or anti-aging doctors would want to see you at. And so I do want to talk a little bit about the differences. Uh, but yes, in general, you know, health coaches are fantastic people to work with and, uh, and a lot of health coaches love this platform. Yeah, okay, awesome. So um, I think we are ready for the slides. Okay. All right. Well, cool. Let's see if I can't share them. All right. So can everybody see those okay? All right. So I want to talk about uh, using biomarkers to prevent premature aging and uh, how it's relevant to hormones. And Magdalena, can you see the PowerPoint? I can, but I think you need to uh, project it as a presentation. Okay. Let me just start it from, how about there? Is that better? Perfect. Okay, perfect. So before I start, though, I want to tell you a little bit about myself so you know who's talking to you. Um, so I currently work uh, as, a, as a professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the Dell Medical School, a fairly new medical school, by the way. Uh, I am a medical doctor with an MD degree uh, from one of the blue zones. If you ever heard about the, the five blue zones in the world, Loma Linda is actually a blue zone. It's where they have more people who live longer than 100 years uh, in the world. And so uh, from that, I sort of learned a lot. And what I loved about Loma Linda is it was a very whole person approach to healthcare. In other words, it wasn't John with colon cancer uh, in room 18. It was, hey, you know, here's John. He's married. He has three kids. You know, he works as a computer analyst. And unfortunately, he's been given the diagnosis of colon cancer. How can we best help him? So it was a very well-rounded educational uh, opportunity that I had there at Loma Linda, and I really appreciated it. Um, however, I went into emergency medicine, and as a board-certified emergency medicine doctor, I found uh, my life to be somewhat frustrated because in the last 20 years, I've literally seen more uh, cancer than I've ever seen before. 
diagnosed far more cancer, uh, more obesity, which more diabetes, uh, earlier strokes and heart attacks uh, than I've seen at the start of my career. So I began to ask my, myself the question, what is going on out there? Really, why are we having trouble with so much chronic disease and what are we doing in medicine to actually help? Because it just seems like what we're doing, whatever it is, it's simply not working. So from that, I did some advanced training uh, with A4M, uh, which is about 25,000 practitioners from all over the world in all sorts of different specialties that have been somewhat disappointed with conventional medicine. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of conventional medicine people that are just looking for other resources and other things to help their patients. Uh, here's a good example, nutrition. I only got you know, a couple hours of nutrition education in medical school. And you know, proper ways of eating is, is probably one of the best ways to actually help people. And doctors are given very little training on this. So the idea was that maybe we, uh, maybe we could learn something. Uh, a story came to mind of a neurosurgeon who had uh, people with inoperable brain tumors. And he was there saying, look, I'm a great surgeon. I would love to take out this brain tumor, but I just simply can't take it out because it's location in the brain, I'll, I'll kill the person. So he would try people on uh, diets and he was trying a ketogenic diet. And he was showing us that for a certain subset of cancer patients on this ketogenic diet, he could actually shrink the tumor just from dietary intervention alone. But that just sort of gives you an idea that there's people out there that are looking for more well-rounded approaches. Now, having done this additional training, I got hired to be a consultant uh, for a company called Biophysical Corporation. They did advanced biomarker testing or lab testing for shows like NBC's Biggest Loser. You might have heard of that. Uh, they did the Oprah show and Oprah Winfrey herself went through our biophysical uh, lab protocols. And so I had a great opportunity to really learn a lot in a much deeper way about advanced biomarker testing. Uh, from that, I became a medical director uh, for an, a PhDX, which is an advanced diagnostic company here in, in Austin. And I ultimately uh, formed my own company for consumers. And it's, it's a direct access lab testing company for the public called yourlabwork.com. And, uh, and I did that because I had uh, people who uh, had tremendous increases in their deductibles. They were forced to uh, pay cash for things. And uh, unfortunately, that's how medicine has gone these days. Um, if you can see that this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. So these are my people, okay, conventional medicine. In this, this article is from uh, earlier this year. It was written by two doctors that are arguing, uh, arguing uh, about trying to do away with the annual physical. They think it's a waste of money. They think preventative lab testing is a huge waste of money. And, uh, and they're trying to encourage us to just get rid of it. Well, I don't know if you're like me, but when I grew up and you know, up into my early adult years, that time during the annual physical was a time to really get to know my provider, to form a relationship for them to get to know my family and my concerns, not only about my health, but maybe what was going on with my job and my stress, my sleeping patterns, these kind of things that are so important in health. And it was also a time for them to run preventative medicine labs and then to do interventions or screening tests. And so the whole idea here is that they're they're, they're really doing away with this. Doctors these days have very limited time. They have just a few minutes with people and they're looking for a disease. So they're making a diagnosis, they're writing a prescription and they're sending you out the door. A lot of times people feel like they've been shortchanged in their office visit for this. And there's been tremendous frustration. So nowadays people are taking matters into their own hands and they're wanting to know more and learn more. And fortunately, with, the, uh, with all the online information, there's plenty of information for people to research. As a company, we wanted to be a company that was able to provide solid uh, research-led um, education to people. And so we put together some objectives that we wanted to talk about today. Um, we wanted to talk about some basic fundamentals you need to know about direct access lab testing. We also want to talk about the basics on hormones and how to get proper testing done. Um, because hormones are so important. But like, you know, like you alluded to at the very beginning of this, you know, without proper nutrients, uh, we have improper metabolism and we can have trouble actually making hormones. 
We also want to talk about thyroid testing and the different ways that it's done. I'm going to show you a couple of examples. And then I'm going to also show you the latest uh, in technology to evaluate cholesterol, which I think is really interesting. And then finally, we're going to talk about a lot about inflammation. This is the really up and coming thing. Uh, people are really learning that inflammation is, is at the root of most chronic diseases. Um, so there's huge impact there. And then finally, you know, we're going to talk about how insulin can really impact weight loss and, and can really predict future disease. And it's important for you to know uh, if you're at risk. And then finally, we have the special offer for this community, this hormones balance community, um, that we're going to present to you for your consideration. All right. So I want to talk about aging well. And we're going to talk a lot about hormones, but hormones are just one piece of the overall pie when it comes to health. So this is an aging well circle. And I want to just point out in, in the middle of the circle are the non-modifiable risk factors. We haven't figured out a way to actually stop chronological age. People are just getting older. They're born a certain gender, they're given a certain genetics, and they're of a certain race. And these are the things that are considered to be non-modifiable. Outside of this circle, however, are all the things that can be fixed, if you will. And many of you are familiar with uh, the top one there, the vascular integrity. That one there um, has to do with cholesterol. Now, I can tell you as a doctor that in, in the 1970s, you know, we were very convinced that cholesterol was killing people and that we had to do everything we could to get rid of cholesterol from, from dietary uh, intake. And so the big fads of non-fat and low fat and so on all originated from that. Unfortunately, everything there got replaced with sugar. And so now we're seeing an epidemic of diabetes and prediabetes and so on. So if you look at the circle down to the right, uh, it says insulin dynamics. This really talks about, you know, what is our, do we have any sugar issues? Do we have something called insulin resistant syndrome, which is the first sign of going on the road to, pre, to diabetes? Or maybe we have prediabetes already. You know, 90% of people with prediabetes don't know they have prediabetes. And 90% of people with prediabetes pre don't have any symptoms. So how, how would they know unless they get checked? And then to the left there is something that this community is very familiar with. It's hormones, uh, not only the sex hormones, but there's also thyroid hormones that can be checked. And then stress hormone, cortisol. Uh, cortisol is a, is a test, a great example of a test that I find very helpful to get a blood test first thing in the morning when you wake up. Because if it's super low, then I try to encourage people to get their sleep evaluated in a formal way because many people have undiagnosed sleep apnea. And I'll tell you this, if, if a person gets their sleep apnea properly diagnosed and treated, it can improve cholesterol numbers, it can reverse uh, diabetes and prediabetes, uh, it can also um, give them more energy than they've had before, and it brings the adrenal gland back into uh, better function and can Im improve the overall function of all their hormones. And then finally, nutrition, we can also measure these with blood tests too, looking at B levels, uh, B12 and folate, which is vitamin B9. Many women are deficient in serum ferritin, which is a transport protein for iron. And then, of course, magnesium, a very common deficiency. So if we're looking at an overall aging well wheel here, we have to approach people in a very comprehensive way. So just like I was trained at Loma Linda, that the person is not the disease, the person is a person. And we really have to take a very comprehensive look at their life in order to actually let them age extremely well. So the outer part of the circle deals with this. We talk about sleep, uh, making sure that you know, people are sleeping well, sleeping long enough, don't have obstructive sleep apnea, and feel great after sleeping. Stress, so important to address to understand people's stress points, whether it's their family or their job or so on. If this is not addressed, this can cause problems. Smoking, of course, this is pretty obvious nowadays, but smoking increases your risk by threefold for stroke and heart attack, so it needs to be stopped. Allergies, this is something to keep people awake at night and interfere with sleep, so that needs to be addressed as well. Nutrition, this one's probably the most obvious. There's so many books and so many uh, fad diets out there, um, you know, whether you're keto or paleo or plant-based or whatever, there's a nutrition intervention for everyone. 
Social dynamics, this has to do with really understanding where a person's coming from and what their triggers are. How are they going to be supported? I mean, we have many people that we want to, you know, put them on a certain diet, but it doesn't work for their family because they're the primary caregiver. They cook all the meals and their family's not going to tolerate it. Well, we have to consider that. And then, of course, if you're, if you're overweight, many people want to lose weight. And the side effect of properly understanding your lab test are oftentimes the side effect is weight loss. Physical activity, of course, the more you use your body, the longer you're going you're, you're gonna to live uh, and be active. And then if you ignore all this stuff, to the right is everything that I see more of in the last 20 years in the ER. Earlier strokes and heart attacks, blood pressure problems, uh, cancers, autoimmune disease, leaky gut, and so on. So you can see that uh, if properly screened for and addressed, a person can truly age well. Now I want to talk a little bit about hormones um, and proper testing. There's various ways, and many of you are familiar with this, of measuring hormones. We can do blood testing. We can test hormones in the urine, such as the Dutch test. Uh, or we can do swab test or salivary testing for, for hormones. Um, my personal opinion are that there are some ways that are preferred. So I uh, really like to check insulin with a blood test. I like to check thyroid hormones with a blood test. And also, I don't know if you know this or not, but your fat actually is the largest endocrine organ in your body. Your belly fat, also called visceral fat, makes either hormones that are pro-inflammatory, leading to inflammation, or they make hormones that are protective for you, anti-inflammatory hormones. And these can be measured through blood tests. You know, female hormones, these can be measured through blood tests and also urine tests. Um, the Dutch complete testing is uh, something we just started offering. Uh, also, adrenal hormones, what about them? Well, I talked a little bit about how I measure the AM cortisol with blood work, and if it's inappropriately low, it makes me suspect obstructive sleep apnea, and we make sure that the person doesn't have that, because if they do have it and we treat it, it fixes so many things. You can also measure patterns of the way that your hormones are being secreted. And these patterns can be measured with Dutch testing or uh, salivary testing. All right. Um, so the Dutch Complete, this is an example of a test that can be shipped to you. So it's shipped to your home and you basically uh, four or five times during the day, you provide a urine specimen and you let it dry uh, on this little piece of paper and then you send it back into the company. And this gives a complete assessment of the sex hormones and also a comprehensive assessment of what that cortisol or adrenal hormone is doing throughout the day, along with some of the metabolites from the adrenal gland. It really is designed to be optimally effective for most forms of hormone replacement therapy. So it is a test that it's very comprehensive uh, and it's a fantastic uh, snapshot of where your hormones are at. And by the way, it can also measure some neurotransmitter metabolites, things that work with your brain. So, um, sorry, can we just go back to the previous sure. slide? I just want to mention, because not everybody knows the sex hormones will include things like DHEA, testosterone, progesterone, estrogen. Um, I don't think they measure pregnenolone. Um, they don't, unless it's something new. Uh, and as you said, also, uh, the adrenal hormones will be cortisol here. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands it's a very comprehensive um, uh, panel, but also what I like about Dutch is the fact that they really look into metabolites, which is how the hormones get broken down. And there's various aspects, including nutritional deficiencies, including stress, including inflammation, that can impact how um, uh, the hormones are broken down. And you know, a good example is estrogen. Uh, you know, Dr. Allen, one of the things that has kind of been um, a, a, a struggle for, a, a, you know, an ongoing education on my part is that women are so afraid of estrogen mm. because of estrogen dominance, right? But mm. yet we wouldn't function as women. We wouldn't have boobs, periods, you know, juicy vaginas without it, right? And strong bones. Uh, yet it's the question is how we break down those estrogens. And that's exactly what that shows. And that's why um, I am a big fan of this test, of this panel. 
Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with all that. You know, um, there is about 400 protective effects of estrogen in the body. And, you know, without estrogen, we start to have a lot of problems. And we certainly are, we're going to talk about uh, some of those things that may not be obvious to you guys that will happen, you know, if you don't have the proper amount of estrogen. So Dutch, what I like about it uh, in assessing it is it gives so uh, much data. And of course, doctors love data. Uh, patients, if they understand, if they understand it, really love data too. And really, this is what lab testing is all about, is, is it's giving us our own individual data that we can then act on. And so our job for you is to provide you the resources that allow you to act on this in the most effective way. Now, and here's so a little catch with Dutch. Because of its complexity, it's not designed for an end user, you know, for a patient to look at this and go like, oh, I know exactly what's going on and what I should do. It really is a practitioner. <clears throat> a practitioner should be, needs to be trained on this. So the good news is, and we're going to talk about this towards the end, we have partnered up with um, doctor, a doctor who does telemedicine and can help you with interpreting Dutch uh, results once you get the results. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's an OBGYN that specializes in this Dutch testing. And so, um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that at the end. But Dutch, Dutch Complete is a new offering for us that we're really excited about. Now, when it comes to hormones, um, we also have to look at other things, right? So we're going to look at some of the common nutrient deficiencies here just for a minute. And we're going to talk about how they're relevant to hormones. Well, first of all, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but about 90% of Americans are deficient in the amount of omega-3s that they have. And it turns out that um, omega-3s can protect you from osteoporosis uh, as you get older. And this is because omega-3s help suppress inflammation. And we know that chronic inflammation will disturb the home bone metabolism. Omega-3s do so many wonderful things in addition to lowering inflammation. They can increase our HDL cholesterol, which is our good cholesterol. Uh, they can decrease triglycerides. In fact, we find that the more omegas you take, either in your diet or you take as a supplement, the lower your triglycerides will go. Omega-3s can also lower this amino acid. It's an advanced biomarker called homocysteine. If you have high homocysteine levels, you're at a higher risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. Very strong association between high homocysteine and Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's and any uh, form of cognitive decline. There's also something called lipoprotein A, which I'm gonna teach you about in a minute. Uh, that I think it's so important for everybody to know whether or not they have lipoprotein A. It's a genetic uh, factor that really increases your risk for heart disease. But omega-3s can actually lower lipoprotein A, so it's important to know that. Uh, omega-3s also tend to shift a person from the uh, small, dense, dangerous cholesterol to the lower, more light, fluffy kind. So we call the light, fluffy kind pattern A, and omega-3s can help you get there. So there's a lot of really great advantages to omega-3, and as you can see, 90% of people are deficient, so very likely in your testing, you may not be, op you may not be optimal. The same goes with vitamin D, and I think this is probably something that's probably a little more well-known now, and the reason why is because we see so many benefits to vitamin D, uh, if you want to talk about it in terms of its relevance to hormones, it's very uh, strong bone builder, and it protects you from osteoporosis as you age. We also see really good data around less cancer risk for many different types of cancer, better control of blood pressure, less depression. It can increase your HDL cholesterol, and we think that it helps uh, insulin actually work better, make it more efficient. Um, we're giving it to people who have seizures, and we're finding that if, we, if they're at higher levels of vitamin D, they tend to have less uh, seizure problems. Same thing if they have psychiatric disorders. If they have a psychiatric disorder and we optimize their vitamin D, we see less in their, their breakthrough psychiatric issues. So it is really important, vitamin D, it's more of a hormone than it is a vitamin. Yeah, just to, you know, you just, it just reminds me too on vitamin D, um, adequate amount, level of vitamin D is also important in conversion of T4 to T3 hormone, yes. right? And, you know, I can't tell you how many women have started supplementing with vitamin D, especially like the one that we have is a D3 with um, K1 and K2, and the hair growth has come back, you know, within a couple of months, right? And so just really... Um, this is what we were talking about right at the beginning, that hormones really, to me, is always the last point that goes out of whack because of the other imbalances that happen in the body, right? Those nutritional deficiencies you're talking about because of that stress, because of the lack of sleep, whether it's apnea or other reasons, 
So, so important to address. This is an underlying, um, underlying reason. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, such a great point. When it comes to, you know, hormones, like everything else, it requires a really comprehensive look from a bird's eye view on a person's total health in order to get your hormones optimized. Magnesium, another common thing that people are deficient in, and you know, many people have trouble with falling asleep and sleeping well, and magnesium can help with that. We also see less depression, less fatigue, blood pressure control. Um, you know, if a, and magnesium does this because it relaxes the smooth muscle cells uh, in our body. So we certainly see this in asthma in the emergency room. If someone comes in in acute distress and they're about ready to die because their asthma uh, is so out of control, we'll give them IV magnesium and it relaxes the smooth muscle cells of the breathing tubes and helps open up those breathing tubes so they can exchange air. So magnesium is very important. And again, it's not something uh, that we're seeing people at optimal levels very often. There's all kinds in addition to the omegas and the vitamin D and the magnesium that we wanna look at. We also wanna look at, uh, for example, serum ferritin. This is the transport protein for iron that I mentioned before. Many women are very low in their serum ferritin levels and serum ferritin levels less than 41, you need to replace that, that iron in your, in your diet or through a supplementation. B12 and folate are also very commonly, uh, people are deficient in those. That can lead to higher homocysteine levels, which I've talked about being a marker for cognitive decline, at least a risk factor for cognitive decline. So we've done studies, we've looked at people with Alzheimer's who had high homocysteine levels, and we said, hey, you know what, if we give these people B12 and, and folate, and, uh, and we watch them over time, will it slow down their Alzheimer's? Well, we found out that it doesn't. So now we've gone to the question of, what if we knew about this 10 or 15 or 20 years before the Alzheimer's diagnosis and we treated it? And the consensus out there in the, in the, in the community is absolutely treat high homocysteine levels or people that are deficient in B9, which is serum folate and B12, because they make up this thing called the methylation pathway. Um, so again, these are very commonly, uh, th these things are very commonly a problem, these nutrient deficiencies that we talk about. The other things that can be measured, we've, we've talked a little bit about and we touched uh, about them. And now I'm going to go into very specific examples for you guys on this Aging Well panel on how we can look at some, some specific examples. So let's talk about thyroid. You mentioned the thyroid and how vitamin D does help with the conversion of T4 into T3. So I just want to kind of give an overview. You know, thyroid disease is especially common among, among women. Uh, for every uh, man that has a thyroid problem, about nine or 10 women have a thyroid problem. So this is very much uh, linked to women. Uh, and there's several reasons why. But if, if, if you're a woman and you've, you haven't had your thyroid checked in the proper way, uh, my argument is that you should get it checked in the proper way and you should get a fairly complete thyroid assessment. Your brain produces something called TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. And it tells your thyroid, which is a butterfly-shaped gland in your neck, to produce these thyroid hormones. They're T4 and T3. T4 is inactive. 80% of what your thyroid makes is inactive thyroid hormone. So you may say, well, well, why is my thyroid making mainly inactive hormone? Why wouldn't it make active hormone? Well, this is the body's flexibility. When you do this, it allows your body to convert T4 into the active hormone, which is T3, whenever it needs it. If it doesn't need it, then it will store it as reverse T3. So it's sort of the master regulator gland, the thyroid. We produce stuff that we don't, that we don't use until we need it. And then about 20% of what the thyroid produces is the active thyroid hormone. So we always have this basal amount of thyroid circulating around our body. And when this goes awry, it can literally screw up every cell in your body. And uh, this is one of the more undiagnosed conditions we have. So here's an example who somebody who came to our direct access platform, and I'm just going to tell you their story, and maybe you can relate to it. So this Dr. was- Dr. Allen, sorry, yes. before we dive into the story, can I just suggest that, let me just run through um, uh, symptoms of uh, low thyroid function. So that, because this is one of the most underdiagnosed and undiagnosed, uh, misdiagnosed uh, hormonal conditions, I think. 
right? We yeah, all know for sure. So many of yeah, us. Yeah. So, so just sure, to quickly, sure. because uh, you know, we get a lot of pushbacks uh, from women saying, you know, like for example, somebody posts saying my hair is falling out, and then we ask them, "Have you had your thyroid checked?" And they'll say, "Yeah, my doc checked, and everything is fine." And so, I'm really glad that you're showing uh, what to test for in a thyroid. But I just want to remind our listeners that labs are labs, um, and especially having a complete um, lab test is really important. But you're also going to couple that up with uh, clearer symptoms, right? So, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, you're so, talking, so yeah. yeah. Did you want to just run through the list of like typical symptoms for a low thyroid patient? Because that's the most common one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I would say definitely uh, hair falling out is a big, it's a big complaint. Uh, one of the bigger complaints we, we tend to get is weight gain. Mm -hmm. uh, although you can have a massive thyroid problem and not gain weight. Um, but but that weight was me. Is, <laughs> yeah, weight gain is a big one. And then we also have um, a depression, a huge, a huge thing. In fact, it makes me so upset when I see people put on antidepressants and they've never had their thyroid checked properly. Yeah. And we ultimately find out they have thyroid disease. Uh, what, a, what a waste. And, and sort of that person got labeled as something totally inappropriate. Uh, so in addition to that, though, thyroid disease can present in just about any symptom. That's the problem. That's the problem with it. But in general, we see the lack of energy, which, which leads to, you know, uh, people sometimes getting depressed from not having the same amount of energy, a lot of hair changes, nail changes, coarse skin, constipation, intolerance uh, of cold, all these things can be signs of thyroid disease. Yeah, I'll just um, add on to this also infertility. Um, women who have infertility issues, unfortunately, it's just, it's so devastating. So many women lose their babies um, in the first three months, right in the first trimester, and uh, without realizing that it's a thyroid problem and never had that t tested. Um, so that's another, that could be another big one. And I also like how you say it about the um, intolerance to, to uh, cold. Um, you know, a typical thyroid patient will be that person walking around in the sweater in summer and always having cold hands and feet while everybody else co is complaining how hot it is, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because that's your, um, it's your heat moderator, right? So like your pedal, it's your speed pedal in every way. Brain fog, I would also add on to this because mm, that's something yes. that I suffered from tremendously. Uh, having anxiety attacks, yep. um, that, was, that was also one of the things that I had. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, thyroid is kind of like, it's the great um, equalizer because uh, so many symptoms uh, it, it can present as, and the problem is it doesn't present with the same ones for every single person. And so just like you mentioned, you didn't necessarily have the weight gain problem. You know, there's other people that do. And that's the challenge with thyroid disease and, and, you know, who do we test? Well, I mean, if you're a woman, you're at very high risk and you should be checked. And I, I mean, I've gotten to the point now where I feel like a woman should monitor this every single year. They should get thyroid testing done because it's so common uh, to have a thyroid problem. Um, there's about 29 million people out there with thyroid disease, most of them women. So if you're a woman and you haven't had your thyroid checked, it really should be checked. So this story I wanted to tell you was about a was was about a lady who you know whose whose name was Mary, very nice person, who had been to her doctor and been told her thyroid was fine, and uh, she had had a TSH done, and she wanted to see if there was more extensive testing. So she wrote us and said, "What other thyroid tests are there?" And we told her, "Hey, this is a panel. This is how much it costs." And she's like, "Oh, I want it." So when it came back, I found it curious because I noticed here that suddenly she has a diagnosis now. If you're a health coach out there or a non, you know, a provider, you really shouldn't, you know, ha you know, diagnose yourself. But if you just sort of look this stuff up and you have the proper education, then you know the question to ask that provider is you say, do I have Hashimoto's thyroid disease? Because these thyroid peroxidase antibodies are positive. And you can see that her, her free T3 and her T4 are at the lower end of normal but here's somebody who had symptoms, who went to her doctor, who did a TSH, who, by the way, it was four at the time. But that's all they did. They just looked at the TSH. Upon a more complete evaluation, there actually is a diagnosis here that needs to be acted on. And this person here, um, you know, ended up going back to another doctor to get, to get care. But the idea here is that the information was out there. She was concerned. She had the resource. She ordered the test herself. And that um, gave her the information she needed to go to somebody to get help. And that's really what direct access testing is for. It's for people to take on some of this information themselves and to act on it. 
Um, some of the other things that we look at with advanced testing, getting back to your aging wheel here, is we're gonna look at cholesterol. Um, and I wanna show you the difference really quick because I'm an ER doctor. Um, so 50%, uh, that's five zero. So 50% uh, of people who come in with a heart attack are at their cholesterol goals. So if they had a standard lipid panel, which just looks at cholesterol and, and triglycerides and HDL, and then does a calculation on the LDL, which is the lousy cholesterol, 50% of the people I see with heart attacks are, are okay. So what is going on? What are we missing here? Why are they getting heart disease? Well, you know, it's a combination of things, but one of the latest tests that's come out fairly recently has been this idea that it's not just about cholesterol, it's about the type of cholesterol that you have. And more importantly than that, we understand that you can get subtypes of cholesterol. So if you go with me for a minute on this kind of busy slide. So at the bottom, we're looking at the diameter. In other words, how big these molecules are. And then on the y-axis or to the left is the density. So that, that's to the point of, you know, uh, uh, how, uh, how much uh, material do they have packed inside? Is it, is it super dense or is it more light and fluffy? Light and fluffy cholesterol markers are less uh, problem, problematic for us. And so if we have bad cholesterol, which is LDL cholesterol, we call it lousy cholesterol. If our lousy cholesterol molecules are light and fluffy, we tend to get less heart attacks. We, we just do. However, if we have small and dense uh, cholesterol, uh, we tend to have the worst problems. And then there's a percentage of us, about 20% of us here in America, that have this genetically modified LDL cholesterol molecule called LP little a or lipoprotein A. This is the smallest and most dense and most dangerous cholesterol marker that you have. If you've ever seen anybody who's really healthy, maybe you had a friend or a neighbor who maybe she went running and she had a heart attack and you're like, wow, she was only 50 and she looked like she was in great shape. That person may have had lipoprotein A. I mentioned at the very beginning, I worked with NBC's Biggest Loser. Uh, and on that show, the, uh, the trainer um, had a heart attack at the age of 50. And if you saw this, I think he was 51. If you saw this guy, you would notice this guy is in extremely great shape, amazing shape. Uh, but uh, there's, he, he had a heart attack due to the presence of, of a high amount of lipoprotein A in his blood. And this is all online. You can Google it and find it uh, about this guy, you know, decent looking guy who had the heart attack. And now he's really speaking out about the importance of getting screened for LP little a. You know, the problem is, and I fight with insurance companies all the time, is that insurance companies refuse to pay for this advanced cholesterol testing because they say, hey, why don't you just put them on a statin? Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Well, the problem is statins can actually increase LP little a. Um, LP little a, I'm going to skip this for a second. Just can talk I ask about you a quick question on this? Is it yeah. genetic? Yes, this is genetic. This is okay. genetic. This is extremely relative to women too, by the way. And mm. the reason why is if you're premenopausal and you get, uh, you get your LP little a tested and it is, uh, and it's high, um, estrogen has a protective effect on keeping LP little a at bay. When you go through menopause and you lose estrogen, your LP little a levels are going to climb. Mm. And so that's a strong argument for maybe in that person, maybe other risk factors need to be considered, but that person might be a good candidate for bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So, so, so the LPA goes up, Dr. Allen, because estrogen goes down? Yes. Okay. When estrogen goes away, so when you're, when you're postmenopausal and you can't make any more estrogen, your, your uh, LP little a levels will, will climb. Okay. So I worry a lot about women uh, who have LP little a, and, and, and these are the women who die young and fit and in shape, and it's the 55-year-old woman who you thought was everything fine, and then she passed away in her sleep. Um, there's 1.2 million heart attacks in the United States every single year, and about 120,000 of these are felt due to lipoprotein A, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you look for it, you will find it, and unfortunately for me, uh, I found it in my wife. So when I first heard about this and began reading about this, um, I started testing everybody, and I found it in my wife, and because I knew it was genetic, I had her parents checked, and her, I found it in her father, which made sense, um, and then I, at my work, I found it one of my nurses who was super healthy, uh, but I knew her mom had a heart attack at the age of 47, so we sent her in for some additional tests, a calcium score, and we found a lesion 
In her coronary artery called the Widowmaker, it's the left anterior descending artery of the heart, we found a lesion in the exact same place where her mother had had a stent put in when she was 48. We tested her mom and she also had very high levels of lipoprotein A. So the idea here is that if you have lipoprotein A, you need to know about it and there's certain things that can be done about it. Um, and we, we're gonna watch you much more closely than we would otherwise. Uh, and it's very important for us as consumers and people who care about our health to push this message out. Because right now, insurance companies are trying to shut this whole idea down, saying it doesn't no. matter. We don't need to talk about it. We don't need to pay, pay for it. And, and so doctors don't know a lot about it. There's, there's cardiologists that know some about it, but we don't really typically test for it until after the person's had a heart attack. Yeah, this is really, really powerful. And you know, I, I mean, I can think of two friends right off that, uh, right off the bat, who have um, history of parents having heart attacks um, at very young age with very healthy lifestyle. So this is really important and powerful. You know, and needless to say, a lot of people in my community are like that, right? Um, question here for you. So. Um, what can a person like that do? And I know that one of the things you will see in terms of the different packages that we have for you guys, education is an option there of exactly what do you do depending on the different markers. Um, but, you know, just, just give me like, a little bit of hope here. Okay. In the, even though this is uh, genetic, what can, like just very high level, what can a person do? Yeah, so there's, there's a ton that can be done when we know about it, right? And I guess that's my, whole, that's my whole sermon here is to talk about how knowledge is power. And just if you go to your provider and you say, hey, I have LPLA, uh, if they don't know about it, it's going to force them to read about it and learn about it. If, if, if they don't know about it, you might want to consider going to somebody else. But a lot, of, a lot of my people will go and they'll get early screening tests done. There's also interventions, some of them natural, that need to be done. Uh, here's, here's, here's an example for you, particularly for women. So if you have lipoprotein A, you're much more likely to form a blood clot. I'm talking about a DVT or a pulmonary embolus. For that type of a person, I wouldn't put them on birth control. Okay, for that mm -hmm. reason, birth control increase your risk anyway. So that, and, and now you're at a much higher risk because of your blood. Uh, the other issue too is I would also consider uh, testing postmenopausal. So if you're high premenopausal, I would test postmenopausal and consider at that point the possibility of biodontical hormone therapy. Yeah. Natural things that can be used to lower lipoprotein A, there's numerous. You can try omega 3 fish oil. The problem is it only lowers it by about 10%. You mm -hmm. can do niacin. The problem is 70% of people don't tolerate it because it causes the flushing, but we get the greatest movement with niacin. It'll lower it by about 30%. There is an online resource for people called the lipoproteinafoundation.org. Mm. And they, uh, they have, and I recommend everybody go to that and I can give you the link uh, for that, but it's a great way to actually for people to realize how significant it is because it has the personal testimonies of people that were, you know, running and had in a race and they, you know, had their heart attack or stroke. And so anyway, uh, and genetics, it's really important for people to, you know, have their uh, relatives checked, particularly if you're in a high risk family. In other words, everybody dies kind of young from either a stroke or heart attack could be LP little A. I advocate for everybody to get checked. And if you look at this pattern here, if you look at this worldwide map, you know, we've always kind of thought, man, what are the Asians doing right? Are they they're eating more fish? They're doing better. What's going on here? Well, if you look at LP little a alone, their genetic prevalence is only 10%, the lowest of anywhere in the world. If you mm -hmm. look at Africa, for example, their prevalence is the highest at 30%. And so there is this genetic difference between people. But here in the United States, one in five people will have it. And there seems to be an, an, uh, an equivalency between male and female. So being one gender or the other is not protective for you. That's incredible. It's one in five. Wow. Yeah, no, it's, it's, super, it's super common and probably one of the most undiagnosed conditions uh, that they're out there. So there's, we're talking today about a lot of things that are undiagnosed that now we can intercept disease instead of waiting for it. The only way you find out if you have lipoprotein A right now is if you're proactive and you're reading and you're learning and willing to test for it. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to wait till you have your stroke and heart attack, and then the cardiologist might consider ordering it for you because maybe you look kind of young and maybe you had your heart attack younger than expected. But that's, that's how it's getting done these days. It it's really needs to be diagnosed, especially for women, because they're at a higher risk after menopause. 
So just to touch on this, I know this is kind of busy, but the idea here is that this is an advanced lipid panel. So this is what I'm talking about is the technology that's available out there right now. Um, the, the first thing that I look at is lipoprotein A, which is at the very bottom of the slide. And this person here, super high risk. This is actually a physician who came through our platform, ordered his own tests. When he got him back, he reached out to me and he was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I, this lipoprotein A thing, super high. So, um, so if you notice, lipoprotein A is part of the piece of the puzzle. The other is we want to know if he has high, uh, small, dense markers. Remember I showed you that graph of, of what small, dense things did. If you look at this LDL molecules from small to large, you see LPLA is the smallest LDL molecule, right? So that's genetic. You either have it or you don't. If you get tested once and you're normal, you don't have to worry about that again. But the LDL size still matters. So if you're low size, smaller, denser, that's a person who's higher risk. So on his panel, when we look at it, we look at, does he have a lot of LDL smalls? So he also is at very high risk. So my point is a fasting lipid panel, it's okay, but it totally missed his biggest risk factors were the fact that of his bad cholesterol, he had the worst kind, and he also had genetically modified cholesterol that was the absolute worst kind. So Dr. Allen, I have a question a for you on this one. Why is the HDL large a bad thing here? Okay, that's a great question. So HDL large is much better if there's a lot of it, okay? So the reason why he shows up in the red here is because oh. they really want you over 9,000 here. Got it, so that's and, not enough. He has, yes, so we know that if he has LP little a and he has small dense uh, LDL particles, we know that the thing that saves him would be if he had a, lard, a lot of HDL or good cholesterol to remove all this from the lining of his arteries, right? That's what right. HDL's job is. It removes bad cholesterol from lining of arteries, whether it's LP little a bad cholesterol or it's small dense or light fluffy, that's what HDL does. The problem here is uh, his HDL total number is low, but mm. even more important to that, the most efficient type of HDL is HDL large, and that's half as, as much as what he needs. And so he's in real trouble. He's going to be laying down plaque like crazy. Well, and, and also just to add on to this, um, you know, for women, we talked about estrogen, right, and the cardiovascular health. But also, you know, when I, one of the things that I used to see when I was in private practice was women with low HDL cholesterol, how many problems they had hormonally to produce sex hormones, because that's your, really, that's your uh, precursor, right? That's your source of producing, cholesterol is the source of producing all your um, sex hormones. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right? If you, so that yeah, would you... be like, you know, he's just 28. I won't be surprised if this man also is suffering probably from low testosterone and low, or D, low DHEA and has like, you know, no sex drive. And then Viagra is the way of going, right? Where actually it's really that problem is right here. And you know what I love about you? You're exactly right. You, this, <laughs> he had that, that exact same problem for that exact reason. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, like cholesterol is everything when it comes to making our sex hormones. So for him, he was, he was low in, in those markers. And, you know, this guy needed some serious intervention. I guess my take home point is I'm not here to teach you every single biomarker right now. Although I, I have an opportunity for you to do that if you're, if you're interested. But what I'm here to tell you is that Right now, we're, we're not checking the best tests to help people. We're checking tests that insurance companies say they'll pay for. We're not actually um, intervening early in disease processes. We're waiting for a disease to present itself. So there are advanced tests now that can be quite predictive of who's going to go on to develop problems. And that's what I want to focus on today because I think that you guys can, can actually be part of a, a great solution and help people, help lots of people. Even if the only thing you do after this is you go and say, hey, I heard this weird thing about lipoprotein A, and I went on Google and I looked up the NBC's Biggest Loser trainer. I read the article about him having a heart attack at 51, and I looked at his photo, and I just couldn't believe it, and now I'm going to talk to my friends about getting checked. Um, if you only did that, you're going to help people, and you potentially could save a person's life. 
because if a person has a LP, little a that's elevated, these are some of the things that need to be done. They need a full laboratory assessment to make sure they don't have sugar problems. And I'm talking about prediabetes. We wanna make sure they don't have inflammation because we wanna to try to reverse inflammation if they have chronic inflammation. We absolutely have to control blood pressure for them. We've gotta get them to stop smoking if they're doing it. We've gotta screen their relatives to see if they also have LP little a. And then we need to know that menopause is gonna be a big, big problem for us because uh, when they go through it, their LP little a is gonna go much higher. So we do worry about that. Um, now, I wanna talk a little bit about the next uh, thing and, and, and uh, you know, sort of bring you along here on inflammation. Inflammation is one of the hottest topics right now in anti-aging medicine. And the reason why it's the hottest topic, it's, it's really felt that chronic inflammation is the root cause of many of the chronic diseases. And there's a lot of things that we're doing that's causing inflammation in our bodies. You know, if we eat too much sugar, what happens? Well, we store it in our liver as glycogen. When that compartment gets full, we store it in our muscles as glycogen. And when that gets full, we store it in our belly fat. And when that belly fat gets full, um, it releases uh, pro-inflammatory hormones. And these pro-inflammatory hormones can actually put you at risk of developing early stroke and heart attack. So again, our belly fat is the largest endocrine system, our largest endocrine organ in our body. And it can produce hormones that are either helpful or harmful. And so uh, if we measure this and we know I hey, have helpful uh, hormones, that's great. If they're harmful, we've got to fix that, right? Um, trans fats, saturated fats can also be pro-inflammatory. This also can happen when we are deficient with our omega-3s and we have an imbalance there. Um, we're not eating like we should. We're not eating whole foods anymore. Um, some people, things are triggering it in their system, such as dairy and gluten, coffee, and so on. And then, of course, stress is a big, is a big thing. We're not sleeping like we're supposed to be. And sleep is so restorative, right? 25% of our life is spent sleeping. So it's so important that we do it well because that's, sleep is when we restore our hormones and we bring everything back into alignment. If we don't exercise, that can be a source of inflammation, of course, toxins, infections, and so on. And in my practice, what I see a lot of is weight problems and this thing called insulin resistance syndrome. Insulin resistance syndrome is super common, and it just means that all these compartments are full, the cells are super unhealthy, and it's the first thing we see on the road to diabetes, so we like to test for it. If you have inflammation, you just need to know, you know, you have a higher risk for stroke and heart attack, autoimmune disease, and even cancers. Um, when we measure this thing called high sensitivity CRP, if it's elevated chronically in very high levels, I send people in for cancer screening and sometimes we'll find cancer. But most commonly what we find is autoimmune diseases that we just weren't aware of. Um, people had atypical symptoms, nobody ever checked them before. But now these very high levels of in inflammatory markers uh, set off the hunt for what the underlying cause was. Another thing is that there's an increase in hot flashes uh, with inflammation, both in perimenopausal and menopausal women. You know, um, I just remembered one more thing about inflammation and hormones. Uh, well, I mean, I think it impacts in every way, but one of it, like the glands ability of producing hormones is one thing, but also the interesting thing, which is I find it so fascinating, is that even though you might have um, adequate hormone levels uh, done by, you know, in the blood especially, the problem is that the hormones might not be getting, when, you, when a person is inflamed, the cells are inflamed and the cells are not able to uptake that hormone. Even though you have it available and it's produced, it's not able to get in through the, to the cell. You know, and to do the work such as having beautiful skin and good mental function and healthy hair, and you know, the list goes on, everything, the hormones impact, which is pretty much everything, how we feel and look. So oh. that's, another, that's another reason to look into inflammation. And uh, needless to say, all the markers that we are talking about here are gonna be on the panels that we're gonna show you at the end that you, you know, we, we will recommend testing for. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's you know the body is a very complex system, right? And unfortunately, it's not exactly so easy why a person's hormones may be messed up if they don't take a comprehensive look. 
So that's the CRP marker that we talked about. It's called high sensitivity CRP, great for chronic inflammation. Inflammation is good for us if it's acute, meaning you know we bump our, our elbow on, on, on something and it gets swollen up and we want it to heal. There's an inflammatory process that takes place. What our body does not like is to have chronic inflammation, inflammation that persists for months and months and months. All right, now uh, back to the aging well wheel here. The next thing we're gonna look at is actually sugar problems. Um, you know, I got invited uh, by the American Diabetes Association to, uh, you know, to do lecturing here in Central Texas on, you know, the problems with, with prediabetes and diabetes. And what I found is that we've got a huge problem here in the United States. Um, and I put together a prediabetes reversal program. And then I got invited to the Joslin Diabetes Center, um, which was pretty awesome because I got to meet the CEO and he was like, wow, this is a great program. You know, we got to figure out a way to roll this out. They recognize that the growth of, the, of diabetes has been a, a dramatic thing. So if we look at this at the bottom on the x-axis is the year, okay? And if you look at the green is the working age people. And then if we look at the yellow, that's the general population. So how we're gonna grow over the next a couple decades. And then if we look at type two diabetes and how it's taking off. So you can see that there's a huge discordance between our actual growth rate as a general population and the growth rate of diabetes it's really reached epidemic proportions. And this is an absolute disaster for healthcare. Um, it's predicted that by the, this is by the Center of Disease Control that one in three people will be diabetic by the year 2050, a, sh a couple short decades away. 90% uh, will be overweight or obese by 2050. And you know, if you're out there struggling with your weight, then you know, you're probably like, okay, yeah, this makes sense. If you just sort of walk around and you notice, um, man, it just seems like there's so many more people out there struggling with their weight. And this is a big problem for us because prediabetes itself, the condition before you ever get into diabetes, uh, you're going you're gonna to lose about 50% of your pancreas during the course of prediabetes. When you have no symptoms, half of your pancreas is going to be destroyed. And if we measure the efficiency, how well the pancreas works, you're gonna lose about 80% of the efficiency of your pancreas uh, by the time you're diagnosed with diabetes. So by the time you have diabetes, you're kind of way behind the eight ball. And I'm here to tell you the, the bad news doesn't end there. Uh, there's also an increased risk for cancer when you're, when you're in prediabetes and also an increased risk for early stroke and heart attack. So our body does not like to have high sugar levels. So when we look at sugar levels, um, the very first thing we, we start to see for most people is insulin resistance. This is just a sign that all the compartments that we talked about, your liver and your muscle and your belly fat are completely full. And now uh, insulin's out there in the bloodstream and it can't push any more sugar in to these cells. They're super unhealthy. This leads to all kinds of problems. Uh, again, this, the ultimate end product is you know, dying from a stroke or heart attack. Heart attack is the number one killer here in the US. A stroke uh, followed shortly thereafter. So at the end of the day, you know, all these things work together together uh, based on sugar problems. So when you get overweight, uh, you'll get the small dense LDL because of insulin resistance. Your HDL will become lower. You become much more likely to form a blood clot, which means that if you have LP little A in addition to this problem, you're in real trouble. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we all struggle with weight. So that's, that's sort of the story there. But if we look at testing, these are the tests that are commonly offered uh, for, for this issue. The first one you can get at your doctor's office and you know you should get one done every year and that's a glucose. The other one's the three month sugar measurement called the A1C. Um, but if we're talking about aging, I want an advanced test. I wanna know even before my sugar starts giving me problems, I wanna know am I, am, am I on the road to having a problem? And the best test for this is looking at your fasting insulin. The lower your fasting insulin level is, the better the situation is for most people, all right? And that's assuming you don't have a diabetes already and you can't make any insulin, because that's what happens, right? If you lose half your pancreas and you lose just a little bit more, your blood sugars go from 110 all the way up to three or 400, literally overnight, because enough of your pancreas has died and you just can't make enough insulin. But the initial response of the body to stress uh, with carbs is to produce tons of insulin. So that's the first thing we're gonna see uh, is called insulin resistance syndrome. Uh, the, healthiest people, the healthiest people in my practice have insulin levels less than two. So I consider that to be optimal. Um, the higher it goes, the higher the problem is. 
Uh, glucose, if you want to know what I think a perfect number is, it would be between 70 and 85. We all tend to creep a little bit higher as we get older. The definitions uh, from the um, American Diabetes Association for prediabetes are glucose is between 100 to 125. That's consistent with prediabetes. If your glucose is above 125, that's more likely diabetes. Now, nobody... I'm just talking from a doctor's standpoint. Nobody really diagnoses diabetes based on one single fasting glucose. They tend to also order the hemoglobin A1C because on that particular day, maybe you were in a car wreck or some sort of stressful event just prior to getting uh, to the, your appointment and you released a bunch of cortisol, which caused your sugar to go up and confused us. So we do this A1C measurement too. This is more an approximation of the three months of daily sugars. So much more reliable to make the diagnosis of diabetes on. So if you're above 6.5%, we call that diabetes. If you're between 5.7 and 6.4, we call that prediabetes. Less than 5.7 is considered normal. However, in anti-aging, we like even less. So less than 5.4% is considered optimal. So if you think about sugar as a continuum over time, uh, and you're able to intercept it in the earliest stages, you want to be looking more at insulin. And unfortunately, doctors really aren't checking that like I, I believe they should. I believe everyone should get at least an insulin, a glucose, and an A1C checked every single year to monitor for this, particularly since I've already told you that 86 million of you already have prediabetes and 90% of people have no symptoms. You know, the symptoms of diabetes don't really occur until your blood sugar goes above 250 for most people. And that's because your kidney is signaled at 250 to start releasing water. And so you'll start shedding off water, which will cause you to urinate all the time and then cause you to be super thirsty, right? And so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, some of the, th some of the symptoms. So I'm gonna show you that in just a minute. Insulin resistance is probably one of the number one problems I see with weight loss. This is especially common after menopause. So if you're out there and you know, you're putting on weight and stuff and you've never had your fasting insulin checked, probably should check it. The blood test will show the fasting insulin that's high. Um, and you may not have yet developed the other findings of, of sugar problems, which are prediabetes uh, and diabetes. So your sh blood sugars may be okay and your A1C levels may be okay, but your insulin's through the roof. Um, and so if you, if you just know that if you could improve your blood sugar control, that's going to improve your symptoms, such as hot flashes, that may be somewhat motivational. But there are real risks besides symptoms, too. I mean, we're talking about end-of-life risk as you have increased risk for cancers and strokes and heart attacks as you go through the sugar continuum. The worse that your sugars go or the higher they go, the higher your risk goes. Also, insulin resistance syndrome is the number one cause of PCOS. So if you have polycystic ovary syndrome, you have trouble with infertility, you're missing your periods, you're having acne, um, irritability, mood changes, those kind of things, um, you know, look at your fasting insulin. It, along with your androgens, your testosterone and so on, will be uh, abnormal. And uh, just simply fixing that is going to really help you. It, it will uh, help normalize everything. I touched a little bit on this a second ago. As your blood sugar goes higher and higher, you can get thirsty, you can urinate all the time, you get blurry vision from the sugar binding to the proteins in the back of your eye there. You can experience fatigue, uh, extreme fatigue. If your sugar's low, uh, you can have the opposite uh, things uh, like being anxious and shaky and sweaty, uh, uh, moody and lack of focus. That can happen for some people when their blood sugars are low. Premenopausal women, um, I see a lot of PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome, really high levels of fasting insulin, along with the acne and the irritability, uh, problems with fertility, those kind of things. And then, of course, the trouble with the weight loss is huge, whether you're premenopausal or postmenopausal, if you have really high insulin levels. Postmenopausal women tend to have increased hot flashes, increased belly fat, and, uh, and that's not a good thing. Um, you know, you don't want to begin to look like grandma before it's time. And that's really what happens, right? As we go through menopause, we start to become like our grandma. We start looking like grandpa. Uh, grandma and grandpa look very similar at the age of 70. So my objective for you guys here is number one, education. Um, that's the opportunity that, that, that we have here that's a little bit different. Being able to order labs for yourself, you can get it done through lots of different platforms, but I encourage you to also get educated too. Um, and so we, we do have a special offer for you uh, through 
the Hormones Balance website for this community. If you want to order a single test or you want to take advantage of some of the packages that Magdalene has put together, you can use this coupon code called Hormones Balance to get $20 off. And then at this, this point, um, I'll turn it over to you, Magdalena, to, um, to kind of go through the different things that you, you wanted us to put together for your community and talk about yeah. the, what you see as the value. Yeah, let's do that. So like, um, like Dr. Allen mentioned, the URL is yourlabwork.com slash hormones balance. And um, we're going to make the uh, URL available in um, all different places. So uh, just before I, I show you the labs, just want to uh, share that it's a really simple ordering process. You order them online <clears throat> with a link down below here. You go to the local Quest um, lab which has got over 4,000 locations throughout the country. And then you get the uh, results online within 48 hours. Really as simple as that, just absolutely wonderful. No, no, no need to see a doctor, no need to um, argue why you wanna have those labs done. Um, and for, you know, we always get a lot of questions. What about us Canadians? What about us in the UK? And so, you know, I can't, we can't help you with this, right? But what you can do is, um, use all this education then to find a private doctor and then uh, work with him or her. All right, so the, here are the three packages that we have for you. Is the Transformational um, Panel Plus Dutch. So the Transformational pa uh, Panel would have a lot of the markets Dr. Allen mentioned today. You can see this all, everything from the Dutch is included here, uh, plus you've, we've got the CRP, the homocysteine, uric acid, and the list goes on. I'm not gonna read through everything here. You can pause the video and just look at that. Uh, we have an option for you for, oh, before I mention that, so the, the package here is $1,699. What this package does include is education from Dr. Allen on every one of these markers, what they mean, what are the functional ranges, and how to, more importantly, how to mitigate them. The other smart thing they have done, which is, I can completely appreciate that, are those, um, is that what you call it, cheat sheets? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cheat sheets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll so talk about those in a minute. But yeah, no, we, we have cheat sheets for patients try to or for people to try to make it easy for them. You know, my cheat sheets for food and nutrition are also so popular because it's something you can uh, I know you laminate them and all that. And, you know, you can have them just hanging on your office wall if you are a practitioner or having it in the kitchen, in the office, um, you know, and it's just a quick referral without having to done to do tens uh, hours of research, but also, you know, <laughs> The internet can be great, but it can also be a problem, right? Because you get a lot of contradictory information. The second panel is Dutch alone. Um, that's the Dutch complete that we're offering here. It gives you the full cortisol um, panel throughout the day. And then um, also shows us the cortisol metabolites, estrogen and estrogen metabolites, progesterone, and also actually progesterone metabolites, testosterone metabolites. Everything is actually with the metabolites. Uh, but also melatonin organic acids, which are really beneficial in understanding on how your body <clears throat> is, uh, your, your metabolism is basically uh, working and um, a powerful on neurotransmitters, which can um, indicate a lot of mood stuff going on, including depression, anxiety, uh, addictions, obsessive behavior, that kind of stuff can all come out from here. That, so that panel is 399. Um, and then we have the hormones balance recommend the panel, which is the the basic stuff. If you if you feel like maybe panel one, panel two is not for you, then the panel three gives you the basics, the C, um, the CBC. So that's your comp complete metabolic panel um, with a TSH. So your thyroid marker, ferret, uh, ferritin. That's your iron storage in the liver. Free T3, free T4. Um, and the list goes on. I, I don't need to read that. So this is a, this is a great starting point, uh, especially if you have already done a lot of things in the past. Okay. So, um, and then if you feel like, you know, so we, we basically repack, we package those, um, uh, the panels into three options here, but if you feel like maybe you want to just pick and choose what you want, there's, there is always an option of that. And I love this website for that. You could just basically click on what, what would you like to order? And then, go and edit to cart and then check it out. So everything that Dr. Allen has covered is all in here. Um, oh, I didn't even see that. So we have even exposure. Uh, so this is heavy metal testing here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And oh wow, you have even genetic testing. Okay. Yeah, we just specific we, markers. Yeah. yeah, we're at we're yeah, we're adding things as people are coming to us saying, Hey, this is what we'd like to see. Yeah. Yeah, and I love the interface. It's just so super simple and uh, just absolutely lovely. So um so that's that and the URL is gonna be below this video. Would you like to share it with us more about the education piece? Because I know a lot of people are gonna be super interested in that. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Let me let me get there here. Let's see if I can get to the education piece. Okay. Yeah. So, so the idea here was that we were going to do this a little bit different for your community because they were already fairly well educated and they're very interested. Um, so can you see this here? Yeah. Okay. So the idea here is that if they decide to purchase the large package, um, we want to give them a ton of great information. And what, so what is this information? Well, I do a deep dive lab training on every single one of the pillars of health that we offer. So we talk about, you know, hormones. We're going to talk about the cholesterol. We're going to talk about insulin dynamics. We're going to talk about inflammation and nutrients. We're going to go through each uh, individual test and give in-depth explanations on what they're actually measuring and what the optimal levels are and really how you can get there. I also have PowerPoint lecture downloads. So maybe if you're a health coach, you'd really like this because you can use this in, in actual pieces to put together yourself and some evidence-based tools that you can use yourself either as a, as a, as a client or uh, for somebody else. Uh, an example that comes to mind is sleep. You know, I, I mentioned before, you know, we were missing obstructive sleep apnea and it's fairly easy to pick up if we just look for it. Um, and one of the things we look at is a very low, lower than expected uh, morning cortisol level. So whether we see that on a Dutch or we see that on an AM serum cortisol test, if we see that, you just download my sleep tools and there's two worksheets with 10 questions each. If you fail one or both of those, either one, all you got to do is take it into a sleep doctor. Your insurance will then cover it, the, the sleep test, based upon the fact that you failed these, these things. These are put out by the, uh, by the uh, American Sleep Academy, uh, the, the people that actually run the sleep specialty. And so these things are really evidence-based and uh, evidence-led. So if, if they fail that, or if you fail that, you just take it in, you get the test done, and guess what? If it gets diagnosed and properly treated, all of a sudden we get the weight loss, we get the hormones working better, we get the cholesterol going down, and we also get, um, we, we can reverse prediabetes and sugar problems with that uh, and give a person energy. So a lot of little tools in there that are, are meant to really help people in a meaningful way. Um, in addition to all the explanations, we want to give explanation, but we also want to give real life things that my health coaches actually use with my patients in my practice. So this offer um, includes these blood tests, uh, plus the Dutch. Um, it was important for us to add on the Dutch here for Magdalena, so we decided we'd throw that in. You might want to know exactly what's offered. So for hormones, it's going to be a little bit different here because we're going to give you the Dutch, plus we're going to give you the thyroid tests, and that includes the TSH, uh, the active thyroid hormone called free T3, and then free T4. And then we're going to also check your antibodies because if your antibodies are positive, then that's going to mean that you have Hashimoto's disease. It's very important to know about that early on. So, uh, so we want to hope that your antibodies will be normal. Uh, the sex hormones are going to be provided by the Dutch, so I won't go into that anymore. The metabolism, of course, if we're going to look at the continuum of blood sugar problems, we definitely want to look at that fasting insulin because remember, that's the first thing I said is going to be super high on our way to, on the road to diabetes. So we're going to intercept that early. We also want to look at your glucose and your A1C. And it's very important for us when we're looking at these tests to look at a comprehensive metabolic panel, looking at your liver function, your kidney function, making sure everything's normal there and measuring electrolytes and protein stores. We also um, do a complete blood count uh, where we're going to look at for any anemia or, or leukemia. I remember I had a, a six-year-old girl brought to me um, in the emergency room by her parents who said, you know, she just not as energetic, you know, we just want to get her checked. And I did a, a, some testing on her and I found that her white blood cell count, which is part of the CBC, uh, was 50,000. And, and, and that, it should be less than 12. And so that poor little girl had leukemia. So a blood test is uh, looking at your bone marrow is really important uh, to do at least annually. You should get a CBC done. Anyway, we included that. 
Cholesterol, you know me based on our short time together, you already know that I'm gonna recommend the advanced cholesterol panel. I want you guys to have the best test available, not just the standard test. And this, you know, of course, test is never covered by insurance, so it's, you know, it's hardly ever done, but it's so important to get it checked and uh, make sure you don't have that lipoprotein A because you're gonna find out on that test. Also inflammation, um, not only are we gonna look at that high sensitivity CRP, which is a great inflammatory marker, but we're also gonna screen you to see if you have high homocysteine. High homocysteine can be fixed quite naturally, so it'd be nice to know about it now as opposed to waiting until you have some cognitive issues. Again, we're not certain that treating it early is gonna, is gonna be 100% protective, but everyone agrees and is on the same page that the, the treatment is natural and it's easy and it should be done. Also, we wanna look at breakdown products of your muscle called CK, just to make sure you're not over-exercising or make sure that you don't have an autoimmune attack on your muscles. Uh, and so we're looking at the CK muscle enzyme. And then finally, uric acid. I love to check for this because there's such a strong association with high uric acid and uh, in prediabetes. And we know there's so many people out there with prediabetes. The thing that I, I learned the other day also is that uric acid levels can be quite high uh, if you're on a ketogenic diet. And so if you have high levels of uric acid, it puts you at risk for developing gout. Gout is a disease that I see people in the ER for. They usually come in with severe pain in their joint, usually the base of their first toe or maybe their elbow or knee, and they just feel like cutting it off. So I'd rather uh, to know if somebody's at risk for this and to be able to show you how you can lower this very naturally. So we have a downloadable sheet if you have high levels of uric acid for you to download yourself. Nutrients, we talked uh, at length about these nutrients, but I also threw in zinc and selenium. These are also very important nutrients uh, that we test in addition to um, everything else that you can sort of read there. But the idea here is to do a very comprehensive approach uh, in your laboratory testing. Um, and I wanna provide you with a way to look at these things too, so you can take all the questions to your provider with some really good information. And again, this is evidence-led information. So I'm gonna provide you with something called optimal value cheat sheets. So if you're ever wondering what it's like to see an anti-aging doctor, or maybe you see a functional medicine doctor, uh, one of the things that you'll, you'll learn if you've seen a bunch of them is that everybody kind of has a little bit different way of doing things. Well, most of us agree on what, uh, what optimal ranges are. Conventional doctors don't really understand optimal ranges because they're not really treating for optimal, they're just treating disease. And so before I did all my training, advanced training, I just knew it is normal or not normal. Now I know this thing called optimal. So these cheats, these cheat sheets were formulated to number one, tell you what the biomarker was, give you, uh, give you a brief description of the biomarker, what it's actually measuring. And then in that gray kind of thing that you can see there, that's the optimal levels where we would like to see you at, at least in my practice. And then to the right is everything that you can do naturally to improve each biomarker. And some of them, we have a lot of things you can do naturally. Others, there's just a few things that you can do. But these biomarker cheat sheets have become extremely popular because people love to look at their own lab work with these things next to it. And then they circle their issues where they're having trouble. And then they, they, they work with their provider, whoever's helping them, to come up with an overall plan for their health. By looking at everything in a comprehensive way, we can now hone, in, hone down on your specific issues. All right, so if I'm gonna do this for your group, I kind of thought it would be really good to do a group uh, live lab review webinar. So if we had enough people go and get this comprehensive testing done, uh, they would probably benefit from, from me coming on and answering questions and going through an example of, of a comprehensive test and talking about each one of the biomarkers and what optimal is and how you get there. It just would reinforce that learning process in the brain and maybe uh, pick out a few things that people weren't thinking about. We also thought it would be good for a question and answer session to do. Now, um, so when it comes to, when it comes to Dutch, uh, Magdalena, we had talked about this. We do have a specialist, he's an OBGYN doctor that I work with who knows Dutch very, very well. And he also is willing to, uh, willing to help us with this. I could probably go ahead and get him to come on this, this live lab review too. But I more importantly uh, want to give you guys access uh, to him via telemedicine. Um, and so, uh, so I'm working with him and, and we'll work with Magdalena so that each one of you that has had the Dutch specialty testing done, which is a very comprehensive, 
uh, has the opportunity, if you want to, to have a private uh, telemedicine consultation with him. Yeah, that's so, so that's so important. And I and I have worked and referred people to Dr. Sean Tassone for for a couple of years now. Um, and he is a um, not just very knowledgeable, but very empathetic and really, really sweet, you know, practitioner who women just absolutely love. This is great. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, the, so the links are below. If you guys have any questions, as always, support at hormonesbalance.com is the is the um, email to send in your questions. And if there's something we don't know, we will definitely reach out to Dr. Allen and get things clarified. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add just to close this off? Yeah, you know, um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity, you know, to, you know, to be able to come to your group and talk about, you know, ways that we can help optimize people. Um, people sometimes do get confused, and I do want to make it just clear is that, you know, I'm, I'm not anybody's doctor. This actually isn't a medical practice. This is a non-medical practice. But as part of what we, our mission is, our mission is to up-level everyone's IQ on lab testing, because we want that person to be able to go into their visit with their provider with a lot of really good information, stuff that's backed by, by research, uh, natural ways and, uh, that maybe the conventional doctors aren't necessarily thinking about, um, and force that doctor to actually sit down and go through each one of these questions based on real data, which is your, which is your lab work. So yeah. we're very passionate about that in adding that extra value add-on. And if, if we can uh, add on Dr. Uh, Sean Tashone, Tashone to review the Dutch testing, that's an awesome, awesome thing for us to do. Yeah, this is fantastic. I am so glad that you have decided to go in this direction and create this practice um, because this really has been a dream come true to address so many emails that we get on a daily basis asking us about testing. In fact, I did, um, you know, two, 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 three years ago, I did a Facebook live on what to test for. And, um, you know, and it's one of the most popular videos that we have most watched. Um, but you know, I, I couldn't really help. I mean, you know, my, my answer to people was go and fight with your doctor, go and find a functional practitioner who will order these labs for you. Right. So a lot of it gets resolved. And so I'm so happy that I have found you and, this is, um, this is phenomenal. I have also met a couple, a few coaches who have gone through your education program and they rave about it. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Important. Okay. Fantastic. So, um, we can also get this, uh, video transcribed. So if you don't want to watch this, you can also just, um, look at the text. Like I'm more of a reader than a watcher on the video. So I want to give you a couple of options of how you want to consume the content and, um, yeah, and as you know, you can order the tests on the URL is going to be below this video. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And I, I really appreciate being on.